Hello, and welcome to Really with Tom and Dave. Hello, Hello Dave. Tom. Tom, how are you, Tom? I'm well, my friend. I'm well. Uh, you know, what's going on with you? No, well, I'm, I'm actually working this week. Um, I'm working on a, a, a show. They've rebooted the show Night Court. Yes, and I'm doing I that heard. This week. Yeah, with I my not, with my old friend in Night Court tonight to this week. How's that going? It's fun. So we're just at a table read today, and I was uh, and everyone was lovely. Uh, Reese Darby is also a guest star this week, who uh, cool. I you may know from uh, Flight of the Concords or uh, Our oh, Flag right. Means Death. Oh, right, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah. Very funny. And how's uh, Mr. Uh, Larroquette? He's delightful. He's delightful. I haven't seen him in a long time. We, I used to, he actually, we did a pilot together a hundred years ago called uh, What's Up, Peter Fuddy. Um, uh, that somebody, uh, it, was, it was a pilot where my, my life is analyzed by a news team. Um, <laughs> so we, it's like a sitcom, but then we keep cutting to the news team analyzing my behavior. And he played funny. The, the anchor of the news team. Uh, and it was weird. Somebody posted it recently because uh, uh, when uh, Kissinger died, uh, they posted a clip from this podcast because we had Henry Kissinger as a guest in the podcast. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That's funny. Uh, his son, uh, David, was one of the producers on, uh, over at USA at the time. A small world this yep. is. Huh? Yeah, and this was a show written by Jay, written and produced by Jake Hogan. And oh, yes. so, okay. so as a result, it never went anywhere. Uh, oh, because Jay, Jay and I are doomed to failure whenever we try to work together. Come on. It's only, it's only a matter of time. Yeah. He's my, we, for those who don't know, he was my wrong guy partner, writing partner with Dave Higgins. And you don't know that movie because it was never released because of the curse. I thought the wrong guy came out. I, yeah. I, didn't I see the wrong guy? Did I see it on video I just, or yeah, something? Yeah, because I used to have a, a garage full of DVDs of it. And so, I, yeah, of course, you've seen it. Yeah. You were forced to see it. It could be why. That could mm -hmm. be why. I recall enjoying it. And how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I should really come visit you. We're very close. We're, I'm in LA. I, and we... I know. We're down the street from each other. Yeah. Which is, uh, you know, this it's scandalous that mm -hmm. we're not hanging out more. It, but yeah, but we a... kind of do every week in this, but the, we should do it in person. And, like, yes. And, then I could, and... and I could talk to your wife. Yes. Yeah. And she, she would like to talk with you yeah. also. She feels very yeah. left out of these yeah. little... Uh, our conversations here. Yeah, it's I miss her. Love to be included. Um, but we're good. We were uh, we visited uh, Luca this weekend. We were in Michigan visiting mm -hmm. Amelia the weekend before. Lots of parental visits all over the place. That's what happens and, when your kids refuse to live with you. I know. I know. We just keep chasing them around. They keep mm -hmm. running further and further away from us. But um, but everybody's doing good. And uh, yeah, I was just kind of getting my yeah. my. So you're up at Stanford. Out. Mm -hmm. We were You're up, up there. Stanford. Yeah. We were up at Stanford. Yeah, actually, met an interesting dad who, uh, and we'll talk about it. Sort of slightly relevant to some of our conversation today was uh, a neuroscientist at this the Allen Institute, which I think is this very cool think tank of um, I don't know scientist high, named Allen. High science. <laughs> yeah, I mean that is the one yeah. requirement which limits yeah. availability, but um, it's a cool concept. In any event, um, yeah, just the. The brain, the brain's an interesting thing. That's all I'm going to yeah, say. Yeah, I'm very, That's my I'm profound been very interested in neuroscience. Hmm? I've always been very interested in neuroscience and knowledgeable to the extent that my brain will allow. Well, he told me to get, I had not, I had heard a lot about this, but I hadn't, this is my, my week reading. Oh, the Michael Pollan. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I read, I've read that. It's Have great. You? Yeah, like, yeah. I'm looking forward to That's it. That's the I'm one also, about all the psychedelics. I have some catching up to do with stuff, so I'm also reading... Uh, this one encounters. Oh yeah, yeah. Which was a good read. Recommended to me probably by multiple people, but also my friend Jean Anzulis of Really Podcast fame and mm -hmm. friendship. Uh, and she's kind of having, I guess, a sort of interesting, sort of familiarizing herself with this all this stuff. So I'm I'm kind of reading as a as like an assigned book report by her because we're so you can we can have talk discussions. Oh, well, that's cool. Yes. I'm glad I'm glad that she's sort of. Uh, Diving into it now, because I know she's kind of avoided the whole subject. Uh, we should talk for people who don't remember. We had Jean on the podcast who was an experiencer. She had a, a visitation and possibly an abduction, but we, you know, but at least a visitation in her home. And how? Um, yes. And yeah, was was scared of all this sort of information. And I mean, just was not a UFO person. In fact, found it like she was, based on her experience, was sort of repulsed by it, but seems to be starting to uh kind of swim around in it and i uh, can't wait to yeah. get an update 
Yeah, I'd love to hear how she's doing. I know. Well, we should yeah. maybe we'll do it. Maybe we'll do it as a podcast. Oh, that would point. be fun. That'd be good yeah, to get a, see how how uh, sort of coming, I guess, coming out of the closet as it were. Yes, has exactly. affected her. Um, speaking of podcasts, yes. Oh, yeah. We should. Yeah, we're doing one. We ha- are doing one, and yeah. we have a we have a really interesting guest today. Um, and I, you know, preface like one of the things when we went to the the Saul uh, Foundation and the Institute and then also in Stanford. Like, also at Stanford, one of the, you know, you've, you, I, we ended up having, I, I found some some of the most interesting conversations with just the people in line, right? You kind of meet people and... Because um, they provided a lunch. So that they, was... Uh, they, yeah. they did, which was nice of them. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't terrible. And mm-hmm. uh, then you got to have really cool conversations with folks. And one of the people that we met is our guest today. Um, so uh, Matt Cook is a screenwriter director, producer of both independent and studio films and television series, and his work includes The Duel, Triple Nine, Patriot's Day, uh, The Angel Has Fallen, The Informer, and Plain. Both The Duel, which was previously previously known as By Way of Helena 2010, was, uh, and Triple Nine, which was in 2012, both made the top 10 of Hollywood's acclaimed website, The Blacklist, which is, as speaking as a screenwriter, that's a hell of an accomplishment. Mm-hmm. Um Cook uh, began his career in the film industry in 2009, has written for Warner Brothers, Fox, New Regency, DreamWorks, Sony, HBO, Universal, uh, among others, and and he's currently developing writing several projects, including The Apostle Paul with Gifford Media, Two Wolves, Alex Gibney directing, and writing executive producing Matterhorn, a novel of the Vietnam War as a miniseries at HBO. That sounds super cool. And The Um, Return of Winn-Dixie, I believe. (laughs) Right, exactly. Um, Matt was raised in the tiny three-stoplight town of Castroville, Texas, uh, attended the University of Texas at Austin, and followed that with serving two combat tours in Iraq with the 1st Battalion, 187th Infantry, the Rakasans, uh, 101st Airborne Division, and has written several articles for Texas Monthly about his military experiences, also served as a correspondent in Afghanistan in 2012 and currently resides in Austin and is a member of the Philosophical Society of Texas. And uh, we just found him a fascinating fellow and a, a new friend to the Really Podcast. Let's bring him on, Mr. Matt Cook. Hey, Matt. Hello, yeah. Matt. Hi, guys. You're still good. You're still with us. Still here. Yeah. <laughs> that green room can be tedious. We know. We just drone on about shit. You're like, what are they? Why? Why are they? Ta- mm-hmm. What are they? Well, Scotch is fabulous, so it's it's great. Yeah, <laughs> we feel an obligation to yeah. uh, just sort of shoot the shit there for a minute. But um, well, it's we, so that people gain gain sympathy for us, or empathy, or just that they they feel they know us. That's the important thing, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Or yes. wonder why we're not hanging out more. Intimacy. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Because are you coming to us from Austin? Uh, are you in Austin at the moment? I am. Yeah. I am. Hey, it hit ninety degrees today in February. Oh, so. geez. Yeah. yeah. Well, well. It's, it's, well <sighs> that's it's raining for the 400th day in LA uh, yeah. today, which is one of the reasons why Dave and I aren't seeing each other. It's because mm-hmm. we, you know, we need scuba well, streets, suits. Yeah. The, the, and driving in LA when it's raining, because people just, they give up, they, they lose the will to live. They just start driving headlong into each other. It's yeah. yeah it's, it's terrifying. Did you ever live out here, Matt? I did. Yeah. Uh, about five, close to five years. Um, I think I moved out there in 2009. Um, so yeah, and then uh, got married. My wife and I were living in Santa Monica, and you know, I think I, you know, the whole time I was out there, I, I, I told myself, well, I sold, I sold my first script, and 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 I moved out there, and I said, I'm gonna give it five years if I can cut a career, fantastic. If not, at least I can say I tried. So, um, so yeah, five years took every meeting, everything my managers, agents set me up with, and uh, got to a point. I think I. I was, I was you're five years in and I'm supposed to have a meeting down the street and they said, let's, um, let's do it through Skype. So we had the meeting. I go and I tell my wife, I'm like, we don't need to be here anymore. Why are we here? And so mm-hmm. our family was, you know, has always been in Texas and we wanted to start with ourselves. So felt like the right time to move back to. And, uh, it doesn't seem to have slowed you down at all. No, I, honestly, I always said the, the best career choice I ever made was moving to LA uh, the second best is leaving. So, yeah. Um, cause you just, you aren't, you aren't in that bubble, that conversation bubble where it's the business all the time. In fact, I rarely ever talk about it out here. You know, we typically talk about other things like, 
UFOs and psychedelics and, you know, and life. So um, mm-hmm. it's been good. It's been nice. Awesome. We, yeah. Well, it was it was just cool. Like I when I realized we were like, I, cause for a minute I saw like our, our like sort of guests of who were coming up, but you know, and, and I was like, Oh yeah. I was like, Oh, this was, this was such a cool, um, we just had a great time talking with you at the soul, uh, yeah. conference or foundation. What is, is it a symposium? It's a foundation. Oh, okay. we, we attended, they put on a symposium. They are a foundation <laughs> who put on a symposium. Thank you. There Thank you for helping me through that. But yeah. the, it, we, we, I mean, I thought the coolest thing was just meeting interesting people. And, you know, I thought your, your story, your interest, all of it sort of, you know, we're in the same crazy business. Um, it just all was sort of dovetailing and felt like it would, you know, it would be great to continue the conversation. I'm, uh, how do you, what were your takeaways from, from Saul? I mean, that was pretty, pretty wild couple of days. Yeah. What, I don't know, what were you, what were the biggest impressions you were left with? Um, I guess a couple things, you know, the, the one impression that, that left me, I guess almost a little bit angry. Right. And it was, uh, and it wasn't at anybody in particular. It was just sort of, you know, it was when Hal Pudoff was doing his Q and A and remember him telling the story about this, this committee that he got put on and, you know, they were splitting up, right. not, you know, to disclose this to the public, mm-hmm. you know, they, they took all these topics of, and then ultimately at the end, they decided, no, not now's not the time. And well, I thought that was a very interesting story. It kind of infuriated me. Cause I was like the arrogance of these people to think that they can withhold that information from the, from the world is truly baffling. Um, and so I think that was probably my biggest takeaway. And now even coming back and, you know, I, more questions than answers. Um, but it really was fascinating listening to very serious people talk about the discussion. Um, so, yeah. but it's, I, I, I'm surprised I even, they accepted my request to come. Um, we were the same thing. We, so were we. <laughs> we kept thinking, oh, this is, they, they must have us confused with another podcast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Look, we, uh, maybe we're media. We don't know. We're, we, but I, hey, yeah. I was happy to, yeah. happy to, to attend. Or they um, just, just, they decided they needed at least one sketch, com- sketch comedian from the 90s in the yeah. group. And friend. So I, I could have been, maybe yes. I was your just plus one. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that was, I think that was my, probably my biggest takeaway from it. Um, I thought all the presentations were fascinating. Um, but I think, I think just the topic in general, cause it's so vast and so wide and it's been going on for so long and, you know, it's hard to really, you know, put, wrap your head around. And so, um, mm. so I don't know if I, if, if it left me with a, stronger opinion before or after I'm still, but it did keep, you know, that itch, that curiosity itch going. That's for sure. What about yeah. you guys? Uh... Well, I found one, I found like one thing that was, I mean, it was such an uh, august group of like giants of the UFO world, you know, and, and also, you know, all the people, you know, uh, a lot of sort of historical figures and the new, and that the fact that there was no one there discussing, is this real? Yeah, that that was that was that was given as a given for everyone there. We're all just going, yeah, this is real. So let's stop worrying about that that, and let's get down to what is it and how are we going to cope with it? Uh, how are we going to reveal it to other people? How are we going to get other people to be to become cognizant of it? Yeah. And uh, and as they become cognizant of it, how do we how do we make that not disruptive? You know, yeah. to the best. So that was really the interesting part to me that this was that it was so much about um, strategy that it wasn't, it wasn't, wasn't building a case for the, uh, you know, UAP phenomena. It was yeah. just a strategy for how do we deal with the fact that this thing is happening over and over again and it's not going to go away. Yeah. yeah I, and I, and totally, I, I mean, that was probably my biggest takeaway is this was, I was like, this is not a UFO convention. Like, let's be clear. This is a very different kind of um, for me, I guess, I thought maybe it was a little bit of a glimpse into our future of, you know, as this conversation kind of, you know, percolates in the culture and starts to become more one of like, how are we adjusting to this, this idea that is kind of getting baked in a little bit more that 
something is maybe here and ongoing and and now we're needing to kind of confront our ideas of religion and our ideas of you know society and and i i think the the kind of i guess maturity of the conversation was sobering um in some ways and uh but yeah i mean i you know we're obviously immersed in this conversation on a weekly basis so he's sort of kind of in it a lot and uh, you know and I try to kind of climb up out of it some to just go like okay like what am what am I feeling or thinking now and and just because you're having a lot of you know conversations about the same topic and exploring every angle like how do I feel about this am I believing it more am I believing it less you know I guess um one of the things that I I'm just, I'm not wrestling with but it is it's I'm curious what you both think of this idea of uh, the telephone, that this is, just, this is just a game of telephone between the same 40 people. And that it's, because that's sort of out there, right? Like, oh, maybe this is just a story that the Hal Putovs are having with the, I don't know who else, but I, I, I mean, do we think that's feasible, possible? Is that disinformation? What are your, what are your thoughts on that? <sighs> I don't know. We've been lied to about so many things um, for so long, and you know, like the the Iraq War, you know, which directly reflect re- reflected me in my life, and um, so it's hard to kind of sift through, you know, what's true, what isn't, what's dis- disinformation, what's not. Um, you, know, you have a lot of really smart people out there now saying that no, this is real, um, and. So it's, it, I mean, for me, I, I've never, well, I've kind of had a, a, an experience a little bit, which I can talk about, but, um, yeah. um, but it, you know, it's, you have like Marco Rubio, you know, who sits on the, the Senate intelligence select committee and he's out there saying, you know, these people are coming in telling us this exists and it's the biggest question of mankind so let's get to it (laughs) let's answer it don't don't just Mm -hmm. tell american people what you know you're being briefed on like tell us um so when you have people like a a a a senator and then you have all these schumer amendments you know in the 2024 ndaa i mean you can't you can't help but to think something's there you know so um So that's, I mean, that's the biggest frustrating part of it, right? I mean, everybody knows something, but no one's just coming out and saying it. And yeah, because the the, the classification realm that we, that we live in, uh, which obviously has its, has its, uh, exists for real, uh, reasons and as to address real concerns, but obviously there's, uh, I think the, um, there's, there is a tendency to overclassify and there's, um, also a tendency, you know, to, uh, to know that knowledge is power and knowledge is also wealth. Um, mm-hmm. so, you know, so controlling the flow of, uh, of, of information on any subject, yeah. um, is, is a pathway to power and to wealth. So it's, it's hard to kind of change that aspect of our culture. Mm-hmm. Um, but I definitely think there's, uh, you know, to me, uh, you know, like all I know is there are, uh, pol- political junkies out there who are, do just live to follow politics and the one political story that none of them know like friends of mine that are very you know just devour that you know every you know what you know like myself watch the sunday morning shows you know every every week and read the paper and um it uh, they don't know that chuck schumer and mike rounds wrote legislation together uh, uh 70 pages of, of, of mind-blowing legislation they don't know that marco rubio and uh kirsten gillibrand wrote legislation together about ufos they don't and they don't know that this is the only subject that's getting bipartisan um unanimous votes in these committees yeah um they don't you know so the fact that to me the thing that still amazes me is how um how carefully most of the public avoids knowing anything Mm -hmm. uh and it's like there's no real need to censor it anymore there's no real need to you know, people have just been so conditioned to not pay attention. Yeah. That even now when, when these, um, you know, 
things that should be huge stories, just as political stories aren't getting, aren't getting anyone's attention. And that's yeah. still what amazes me about the whole subject more than anything. Yeah. Yeah. I think the plasticity of our brains just, I, I have this myself, you know, it's like, I, I like stretch it out. I stretch it out with this topic. I stretch it out, but it's just at some point your brain wants to recoil. It like wants to kind of snap back and just be like, let me put it in the, and I think we have a kind of cultural condition with that a little bit. And I, and I, and, and sort of parallel to that is I've just been reminded recently of just how good the government is at keeping secrets in a lot of cases, you know, like the money, the money that goes into secrecy and keeping things, you know, from us or, you know, uh, black programs or whatever. So I, I find it, uh, I find it very credible that there are programs out there I know know nothing about that um and and now and in fact we kind of are finding out about right but there's still this lack of 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 pure acknowledgement even though there seems to be this sort of growing body of witness and uh, testimony and whatever but you know the government dedicates incredible amounts of its power and wealth to just keeping secrets and I think they've done it fairly mm -hmm. effectively through the years and yeah and the military is very good. We should point out, like, yeah, government officials aren't terribly good at secrets. Yeah. You know, politicians. But but the military, which is a part of our government and intelligence community, they're excellent at it. Yeah. They're really, well, you know. But also to that, I mean, there is such a vast amount of public information that's available in, like, government archives. That's, like, NASA's archives, like, transcripts with astronauts in space hearing music. Where is that coming from? Talking about, did you see that? What was that? You know, like that stuff's available. You have, I don't know, a dozen astronauts in the last 40, 50 years have come out and said, you know, we're not alone, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and, but you're right. It, it does. It gets buried in the noise and, and. Yeah. Well, and just the, the condition, the conditioning of people to just go oh, UFOs, <laughs> that's not real. Yeah. And then they just don't, they don't pay it. They put it over with, you know, you know, like with Santa Claus, you know, yeah. people that believe that are crazy. Um, you know, or, you know, so it's, it's, you know, it's it, just that, that willingness to, um, well, and just also just the, the fact that, that on, on so many other levels, you got to think how, how many other, what other subjects are we be, being conditioned to pay no attention to? Yeah. You know, what other things are we just blithely patting ourselves on the back for being too smart to think about? Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's well, it's, it's, it's coming through the cracks, no matter what they say or do or don't say about it. Um, and I, you know, and I think we all, we all kind of, and I think one of the reasons that it's doing that is because there are so many different ways to the topic and, and avenues to the subject. And um, especially as this sort of subject of UAPs and the paranormal, they begin to kind of Conf conflate they're they're becoming more and more almost the same thing and which leads me to you know you matt and your your journey which is one as we were talking you know uh a few months ago i mean it it's it's kind of a spiritual journey it seems it's sort of a healing journey mm -hmm. um do you want to just walk us through you know just uh, you mentioned iraq you mentioned you know uh, your time in the military. I know your takeaways from that were intense. What, 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 what were, were you a kind of 9-11 person? And like, I was going to, you know, was that the, the, the impetus for getting involved or you, you, what was, what, what got you first to enlist? Um, well, my first day of basic training was 9-11. Oh, very okay. first day. Oh. So, so I, I, I didn't enlist for that reason. I, you know, in college, I, I, sort of prayed at the altar of Hemingway. And so, you know, I wanted to go have that, you know, become a man, you know, write a passage, um, you know, go fall in love with some foreign women, have some adventures, jump out of planes. And, you know, it's a very romantic idea of the military. Yeah. The Fitzgerald <laughs> altar is a lot less exhausting. Uh... <laughs> but also get my student loans paid off. And, you know, so, um, so I enlisted after college and then I said my, my very first day was 9-11 and which was very, very surreal. And I, so it's, it's a, so this is, and you can't really make up the way your life. It's like that moment of your life just 
goes this way. Yeah. And, wow. and so, you know, we were marching to our barracks and, and then we get there and they split us up into um, four platoons and the company first sergeant walks out says, anybody here have family that work, live in the World Trade Center Towers in New York City? No one says anything. Says, anybody here have family that work at the Pentagon? No one says anything. So, all right, drill sergeant to yours. And, and so let me begin by also saying, like, this is uh, infantry based, basic training. I mean, our cadences are left, right, left, right, kill, 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 you know. And so, so, you know, we go through the typical first day of basic training, which I assume is just the normal day. You know, we're getting fucked up, scuffed up, you know, sort of push up, silly puke kind of thing. And, um, we, uh, night comes and we're in our barracks and it's like probably one or two in the morning and we're all standing at attention in front of our bunks and our senior drill sergeants walking around telling us what to expect when they wake us up in 30 minutes. And, um, and he goes to the door and he says, Oh, by the way, uh, today the U S was attacked Two uh, planes took down the world trade center towers in New York. Another one hit the Pentagon could be as many as 20,000 dead. And then he goes, congratulations, you're the first class of the new American war. And he turned off the light and that was my 9-11. And, um, and, and you uh, had no, there was no real, uh, it, I mean, it was, you had no other context, con communication or anything. Oh, shit. No, no. I mean, and I didn't believe it. Like the whole first week of basic training you're in, um, com, you know, complete control. You don't have any, you know, the outside world and so they're just they're giving us tidbits telling us and i just don't believe it for an entire week i do not believe it and you know i just think it's part of the, the psychological you know gains of basic training and then finally after a week um they willed in some tvs and let us watch about an hour of the news and i was like why and so um so yeah that that was my 9 11 and wow. i ultimately ended up in the uh, 101st airborne division and um, the two deployments in OAF one and OAF three. So 2003, you know, the invasion, and then we came back for about 11 months and then went back again. And then I ended up getting out in December, 2006. Um, and so, you know, had a completely different experience than I thought I was gonna have um, when I enlisted. You went to war, you really went, you really went to war. You were, it was yeah. Not, yeah, that. Um, mm -hmm. And what, you, your uh, deployments were both in Iraq? You were, yeah, you were never deployed in Afghanistan or in, uh, no, I went to Afghanistan in 2012. Um, my, my old unit was deployed and I, um, and I wanted to understand Afghanistan. So I reached out to my, uh, my old battalion commander and, you know, I was like, Hey, do you know anybody still with the unit? And he made some calls and they're like, yeah, you can go. And so I called up Texas monthly cause they had published some of my other, um, stories and, said, Hey, you interested? And they said, yeah, go. So, so I went to Afghanistan for a little while, um, which was a completely, completely different experience, you know, shooting war through a camera as opposed to a rifle and yeah, and then just completely different combat experience. And, um, you know, and with war, everybody's experience is different no matter what. Um, but, uh, so yeah, but both, both, uh, actual combat ex deployments were, or to um, to Iraq, and the 101st Airborne. I'm no I'm no expert. That sounds so. Um, I, I I assume that was a lot of a seeing a lot of action or seeing or I don't know. Is it is it a lot of I mean is it is yeah it constant? Yeah. Is it nonstop? Is it wh what's the uh, yeah, what's, that, what's that experience like? Yeah. Well, you know. Uh, OAF one, the invasion really wasn't a ton. You know, we had some small. My my first firefight was, you know, probably the well, it's definitely the worst of my first deployment. There were six of us, and um, we were coming back um, from late from patrol. And at the time, we had like those open air Humvees. We weren't riding around in, you know, um, armored Humvees. And um, anyway, we uh, and this is. So we were, even on our way home, we, you know, it was so quiet, nothing seemed to be going on really. And so we were out at this old Fedeen compound and we decided, you know, time to go back. So we raced down the, like the Fedeen, you know, road to the main MSR, the main highway. And I, my Humvee got hit, hit it first. And so, you know, we were in front, second Humvee behind us and we're about halfway home and we get ambushed. Um, 
RPG hits the second Humvee, um, kills two of my buddies and a third okay. wounded. And so we get to this big, big firefight. And um, so that was my, that was a big one in, in my first deployment. And then um, a couple other little skirmishes here and there. And then the second deployment, um, you know, it, it, things were like really escalating, especially with um, the sectarian violence between the Sunnis and Shia. And then, I mean, they were knocking each other off left and right and both trying to knock us off. So, um, so yeah, we saw quite a bit. Um, now, not as much as some, but more than most. Um, but uh, it, it was madness. It was just madness. Absolute. And I imagine nothing in, tr- I, I mean, in, in training, uh, they, I assume they're trying to prepare you physically as much as possible. You know, t- are they able to prepare you mentally for what you're about yeah, I mean, to encounter? Yeah. I mean, to a certain extent, you can only prepare for so much, you know, I, I remember like my first firefight, I was describing, I remember, you know, I wrote about this in my Texas monthly story that like time just stopped, it, like just stopped. And I, I was like, they're shooting at me why is anybody shooting at me? And I was like, well, shit, I got to fire back, you know? And I was like, <laughs> but that moment you're, you're like your, your brain just does this, you know, you just, and it, you become a, a different sort of human, you know, when you experience something like that, you know, in a way trauma, a lot of people, have, you know, go through trauma and your brain just sort of changes in ways. Um, and so, but I had really, really in, incredible um, leaders. Um, uh, my second deployment, I was a staff sergeant, so was, um, so uh, um, I had you know more in charge of the enlisted guys. But um, but we had really great senior officers. Like my battalion commander, my second deployment is now chief of the army. Um, and I will say this about him: his name's um, General George Randy George. Um, you know, we're living in some pretty crazy times right now with Ukraine and Israel and everything. Like it does give me peace of mind that someone like him is sitting at the top of the army and, you know, is, has a level head and is really very intelligent and um, caring, compassionate guy. Um, so that, you know, does give me some peace of mind. And I hope it, you know, he's really uh, just an incredible human. Um, and all, and all my senior leaders were really, we had really, really incredible leadership. So, you know, prior to these deployments, you know, we, we train like, like crazy and um my uh my brigade commander my second deployment did you guys see black hawk down yeah Yeah. so so, um his name was colonel still was he was a colonel and he was our brigade commander but uh he was a character in black hawk down he was like the uptight captain you know walking around like hey hey soldier your weapons on on yeah 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 yeah, yeah. so that was you know they didn't really portray him all that well in, in black hawk down but the real guy you know, he's six foot four giant and played football at Georgia, just hard charger. And um, he whipped our ass physically. So by the time we went on our second appointment, we were in very, very good mental, physical shape, just, you know, pushing as far as we could go. So we were, you know, as prepared as you can be under those, you know, circumstances. But, you know, when you get hit by IED after IED after IED and you're fighting ghosts, it just, it, it, it does, it drives people, you know, bonkers to, you know, it's, it's a struggle. So. When, well, I mean, first of all, like if, and I didn't say it, but just thank you for your service. I wow. mean, it's, it's a, no, seriously, man. It's, um, mm-hmm. it's funny. I, my, my dad, I think dealt with, um, I think he, he, I think he was dealing with, uh, kind of untreated PTSD for most of his life after, cause he was a lot, he was a, I had an older dad, mm-hmm. so he had been Korea, World War II kind of, you know, um, but it's, I think the, you know, the takeaways are obviously lasting. When we met, we were talking, we, I think our conversation had started um, kind of about sort of, uh, you know, some of these uh, kind of explorations that are in the kind of chemical world and the brain and, and, you know, what, and, and you had been talking about some of your experiences, which I think were related to sort of just kind of your healing process. Yeah. Um, but it also sort of led you to Saul and, and, and I, and we've talked a lot about, um, you know, is, or is contact possible in different ways? And do you want to, I mean, do you want to just sort of walk us through what kind of got you into the, that, that area or like what, what led you there? Yeah, it was, um, 
combination of things. Um, so, you know, for years and years and years after the army, you know, I, you know, I kept for six months out. Um, I really started to backslide. Um, and I didn't think, you know, I was a college graduate. I got the army I'm a little bit older. I thought, all right, I'll be able to move off my life. No big deal. But, you know, I really, um, you know, got, got hit and slid, um, you know, started going to the VA and got, you know, diagnosed with all the things, PTSD, TBI, um, uh, tinnitus, you know, and everything that falls under those umbrellas. And at first, you know, I remember the conversation and I was drinking super heavy and, um, really just, you know, self-destructive as you can get. And, um, go to the VA. And I remember my first appointment with, with the VA psychiatrist and, you know, and, and he says, okay, well, I'm going to prescribe you this, this, and this, but you can't drink on it. And I was like, well, I'm not going to quit drinking. And he's like, well, you, you, you can't, you can't drink with it. And I'm like, well, they don't give it to me. He's like, but you need it. And I go, well, I'm not going to quit drinking, you know? So they still gave it to me. And, you know, I got turned into a zombie for months and months and months. And then, um, and at the time I, I met, um, uh, my now wife, um, who, you know, for whatever reason, just stuck with me and, you God know, bless her. Good for yeah. Her. and, um, and so I took myself off the med- medication, um, but still for years and years and years, um, you know, peaks and valleys of, you know, sleep deprivation and, and you know, and then you know, I managed to sell a script and move to Hollywood and sort of coming like this high functioning, you know, screenwriter with PTSD drinks too much. And, you know, and, um, and like I said, peaks and valleys, I go, you know, a couple months for speed, right? Dark, dark, dark. And I, I was never a sort of, I wouldn't say I, I was ever had thoughts of suicide, you know, but like, I certainly didn't, uh, I, there were times where I certainly would have welcomed just let's, let me just get out of this world. Um, and, um, so, so cut to, you know, however many years. And, um, and so I, so I, that's where it came first. So I, um, I went to Puerto Rico to shoot plane. This is that all the movie that came out last year. Um, and, uh, I'm actually in it too. I was probably playing a mercenary. Um, oh my gosh. I got to That's one I had. Yeah, I had actually actually first, that, but... And it was the first time I picked up a, a weapon since that I, I well, the first time, but first time in years since I had picked up a weapon and you know, how how'd that feel? Oh, it got pretty surreal. Um, you know, playing, it sounds, it maybe sounds a little silly, but we were, I mean, doing like really heavy, you know, heavy action, a lot of shooting, a lot of shooting, a lot of shooting. And, um, you know, and I was in Puerto Rico for like two months. And while I was there, um, I came friends with this guy, um, Pete, who was a former Navy six or Navy SEAL, uh, SEAL team six dev grew guy. And, you know, towards the end of the shoot, he pulled me aside and he's like, man, you're pretty fucked up, man. You know, I like, need to go to Mexico. And he starts telling me about this retreat called the mission within. And that he had gone to, and um, and they, you know, they treat they treat veterans with PTSD uh, through ibogaine and 5 meo DMT, and I was like, okay, yeah, all right, you know, and, and you know, I'd done I'd done a lot of drugs in college. It wasn't like this was going to be my first, you know, foray into it, but it is certainly a choice to go and do something. Yeah ceremonial and ritual yeah. and actually get, try to see, you know, real help for it. My wife was finally like, please go, please go. And so, um, so I go and, um, you know, it's me and, and four other, three other guys and you want another Navy SEAL, a Marine and a Navy corpsman. And, you know, they could show you, the, you know, pictures of us before and after. I mean, we look like different people when we left. Um, and, um, you know, it would take me 20 episodes to describe everything, you know, that, you know, we went through in the medicine, but like I said, it's very ritualistic. So leading up to the retreat, um, you know, we get assigned a, a coach and we start talking, what do you want to 
what do you want? Why are you coming? What do you want to, you know, improve? What do you want to leave behind? And start writing your intentions and, you know, really start meditating much more. And, um, and then while you're there, you know, it becomes a ceremonial experience and, you know, you kind of sit there and you, know, you got a bunch of macho guys and we're all breaking down crying and, you know, and it's, um, and then you go into the medicine and everybody's experience is different, obviously, but you know, they say like, you know, the medicine is going to give you what you need. And so, you know, I began, typically you're in it four to six hours where it's like you're out and you're in it. Um, and then, you know, you can finally get up and it's still coursing, coursing its way through you. But for my I began, I was in it for like 22 hours. Oh, wow. Uh, a very long time. And I thought I was just going to go, you know, it was going to, I was going to have to relive all these things I experienced and, 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 the medicine wouldn't let me even come near it. Like, Interesting. You know, it, and a lot of people, it sounds a lot too, I think with Ibogaine and, and with ayahuasca and some of these other psychedelics is people, uh, I guess, a some sort of guide comes to them in the medicine. And I had a guide and, you know, I, even when I wanted, I was like, I'm ready to go to war, take me back. And, you know, it wouldn't let me go. And mm-hmm. it's just like 20 hours, 22 hours. And, and it's, it's- can I say, was the guide, was an actual, like, it felt like a personality, an entity that you were, that was communicating with you? It was, for me, it was like, it's hard, impossible to explain because of visuals, but a lot of it, I was out somewhere in the cosmos and my guide was like this nebulous spirit and um, that I could communicate with. It wouldn't like telepathically. Um, and, you know, when I would ask to see something, if it didn't want me to see it, it would shake its head. And then it would, you know, and then boom, take me somewhere, you know, and, and a lot of it at the beginning, this is pretty funny too, because I have, I have three you know, young children and the first thing I, I see in the medicine is, you know, I'm, I'm somewhere in the cosmos and I start seeing these figures approaching like hundreds of them and they're coming down slowly, slowly, slowly. And it's, you know, the stars through the stars and I get closer and I recognize them and it's like all the characters in Paw Patrol. Yeah, you know, <laughs> like, that's not what I expected. Yeah, that's <laughs> no. not what I expected. And then, and then for a while, it was just like I was just like reliving all these forgotten vignettes of my of my life, especially as a child. And um, you know, the, and I had a great childhood, great parents, great siblings, and so yeah, it's just like reminding me of all the things you know, and and just like it just it just absolutely crippled me with love for 22 hours. Um, and so, so yeah. And so I, everybody else, I missed like the entire next day of integration meetings when everybody's I talking bet. about their experience because I was still in mine. And so the, the day after, um, you know, the coaches in the retreat are like, Matt, you know, we're going to let you go last, you know, cause five, um, MEO DMT is, it's a slingshot through the universe. I mean, you smoke it. And so it's like, it's instantaneous. Like, and you know, I was like, if you make me wait, I'm going to talk myself out of it just because of, you know, 22 hours of that, you know, you know, it was exhausted. So and, you're doing both. You're doing both in this retreat. Yeah. You're doing both. And, wow. uh, and so, um, was your, was your anxiety? I mean, I, I can only imagine the anxiety just going into this thing in the first place. Am I going to have to really, you know, is this going to be some sort of, you know, test of my, you know, endurance to go th- like, you don't, cause obviously you don't know what it will bring yeah. to you or what it will ask of you. So how did that compare the, before the Ibogaine versus then the anxiety before, were you more prepared, less prepared, like worn out. I mean, what? Yeah. Well, going into it too, like, you know, there's a real, you know, you're, you're preparing to go and, you know, all your coaches and the therapists keep calling it medicine. And I'm like, just call it what it is, you know, and they're like, med, it's the medicine, it's the medicine. And so, so going into it, I was like, you know, um, didn't know what to expect really, you know, but I was really trying to open myself to, you know, the fact that it's going to give me what it, it's going to show me what I need, you know, I'm going to trust in that. And so I did my best to just even, you know, when, you know, when we, when we drank our tea for the Ibogaine and I was just like laying in bed with my, my mask and they turn on the music and 
just telling her like, okay, just don't fight it. Don't fight it. Whatever comes, comes, don't fight, don't fight. And so, um, and so there were times when it was like, I would be, you know, in like whew, these blissful vignettes and then I would get sucked into a room of chaos and, and I would have to like, really like kind of breathe my way through it and then back into, you know, back to my guide. And, um, and so when I came out of it, I was exhausted. I really was, but, um, but in a good way, like, you know, like emotionally drained, but a really sort of way where you feel like you've gotten past something. And then, and then with the five MEO, it really was more like, I just don't make me wait, uh, you know, um, cause the five MEO you do by yourself, you know, and I began when we were all in the room together. Oh, okay. And the five MEO you do with just yourself and your, and your coach and therapist. And so, and I, and I didn't want to over research five MEO because it's really, it's, it's powerful stuff. And so I didn't want to psych myself out watching some crazy YouTube videos and right. so, um, but after the Ivy game, I was like, please just let me go first. Let me, let me do this. And all the guys were cool with it. So, um, so I, the five in the O was and, and the way they did it, the way they do it, the retreat is you basically get, um, five, um, five doses, you know, and, um, when you feel yourself coming out of it, if you want to go back in, you give them the signal and now they sit you up and you smoke it and you, and you go back into it. And so, Ah, uh, man, the first three, I can't even, you can't describe, like, it's like, you know, even, I mean, it's like, you don't have to believe in God, but you're with God and he's in you and you're in him and you're like, it's just like, I mean, my experience was, I should say, I shouldn't say it's for everybody. Um, I mean, it was just like the universe was peeling back and just this is it. This is what it's all about. And then, and then it got real dark, um, started turning really dark. And, um, I, I were like this darkness started coming into the world and I was like, I have to go kill it. And, and then I'm talking to like my higher self as like, I mean, it feels like I'm talking to you guys as real as I'm talking to you guys and my higher self. Like if you go, you'll die. And I'm like, but I have to kill it. And it's like, you'll never see your wife and kids again. But I have to kill it. And so, you know, I said that and just I know it's I know it's really hard. Can you what the it can you de and describe it? The best visually, way, physically. Yeah, visually, it really was like being the most beautiful place in the world. And then it's like it's like black cancer just starts eating away at the world, at the universe. And, and um, I mean, it's that's the closest thing I can describe. It was just it was just built and and i hated it because it was in my world and and so um and i know you know and i realize now it was just rage there's all the rage i had i mean it was just like and it was coming and um so i felt myself coming out of it and so i you know asked for another hit and got my hit and basically went to war with this blackness and eventually i felt like i was in the middle of the sun and and is like pulling, ripping me apart, pulling me apart. And I, I'm fighting it cause I want to destroy it. Like, I felt like I want to destroy the universe. I want to take it all with me. And, um, and then it killed me. Like I, I, I went and I, I remember talking. I was like, Oh, this is it now. And it, I died like very real death. It just felt if, as real as you can think, I guess, so, you know, and, and so, you know, and I went from that into like that, you know, the beautiful white, perfect light, you know, the people out of body experiences, you know, see and, um, went through that and came out of it into uh, space. And it's just like, I had no idea who I was. Um, I had no idea where I was. I had the feeling that I wasn't staying there. Um, but it was like the most peaceful harmonious feeling you can imagine and i just felt like i was so a part of the universe um so so it came out of that um and when i came out back into the room 
I, it took me about a minute or two to, you know, kind of get my senses back, realize, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm mad and I'm here at this retreat. And, was there any, was there any communication with anything between being in that place of harmony and oneness to the return? Or was that all just a kind of internal physical process that just brought you back? Yeah, it, it I could have been there for a million years, you know, that's how it felt. Like I, there was no time. It was just, you know, it's the physical body, you know, kind of getting over the medicine and you're coming back into this world. And, um, and so, yeah. And then ground, like after a couple of minutes of grounding myself, I, I just started sobbing and I sobbed for a very, very long time. And when I finished crying, I, I never felt better in years and, and it was like the most transformative couple of days of, of my life. And I'll, in, in the guys too, and by the time we left, I, I you know, and, and again, I'm not saying it's a, it's a cure all, um, because it's, it's not, you got to work at it. You know, when you get back, it's, it shows you things, helps you through things, but you got to come back and sort of take those things and integrate them into your life. And, and so, um, and so, yeah. And so I just, and when I got home, um, my wife for the first couple of months was like, I love this new you, but I'm, I don't understand it. How one, like one weekend can do this. And so the retreat would, um, occasionally do, um, retreats for veterans wives. And so, um, I was like, would you go? And she was like, okay. And so she went and, um, the women do, um, they do psilocybin and 5-MeO DMT and my wife came back and she had a phenomenal, phenomenal experience. And she really didn't, I mean, she, I was like her trauma. So, you know, she wasn't going to, you know, you know, to heal herself from, from something horror horrific, you know, um, but she had like a very Kundalini type experience, very, very spiritual. I mean, light and God and Buddha and you name it, like just through her. And um, yeah, so she came back and it was transformed for her as well. And so we've both, you know, since, you know, gone to more retreats and, you know, kind of, it's not something we do every, every month or anything like that, but it's sort of like, you kind of feel like, oh, a call to it. Um, and you go and my, and so the second one, last one I went to this last summer, you know, I, you know, you, you sort of, if you, if you really believe in it, you kind of, you kind of, before you go, you start, this is what I want out of the medicine. And you kind of like talk to the medicine. Like when I come, this is what I want to see. And, and so, um, and so I'll tell you about that in a sec, but my second retreat or my, my most recent, but so between I, Matt, I, this oh, is yeah. a small, it's a small question, but I'm curious if, first of all, I'm just so like, I'm so just, I'm just great that that, that this is now like available to, you know, veterans and for this treat, like, I'm just, that's such a, it's, it's just it's so be different nice to make than it what, available in the U S would be nice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know they, they, they do and they should. Um, and I think telling stories like this help helps that process, you know, it helps just, uh, but were you in touch with the same guide between each journey or were they very different? Um, you mean uh, from the retreat or the guy Pete? Who I mean, in the, I mean, I'm actually the guide that you had in that first, um, the sort the, of, the sort entity. of journey. Yeah. The entity, was that a presence at all in the second sort of the DMT version or were they just sort of separate in that sense? Yeah, they were separate. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't have, um, I, you know, and I, I really don't know how to describe him other than like he or she or it, whatever it was. Um, it felt more masculine. Um, but um, it just, it, it's, it's some sort of spiritual guide, some sort of meditation guide, I, creation. You know, I don't, you know, it, it, impossible to explain. Um, and not everybody has that experience. But, um, but yeah, uh, between the, I began in DMT, yeah, I haven't that whatever that was i haven't you know but i haven't done i begin again i have did, I've done psilocybin um mm -hmm. but um but yeah I, I think it was just exactly what i needed when i needed it um and so so, so i'm sorry i cut you off when you were going to talk oh, about no, 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 I, I was going to get to hear how i got really in, a lot into this world and so 
so between that first retreat and then the last, um, I, with the, this whole topic of disclosure and, and whatnot, I got a call. I, the first retreat definitely opened my mind to, to things, um, new ideas. And, um, and so I got submitted a project, um, not long after the retreat, um, by some producers who were trying to develop a, uh, movie, a biopic about John Mack and who I never, I never heard of John Mack before. So, so, um, I read his books and I, you know, and, uh, I read Blumenthal's, you know, bio about him and, um, watched everything I could. And, um, I was just completely fascinated by this guy. Um, and so for me, like, I'll, I was like, I want to write a movie about this guy. Cause you know, everything he went through, at, you know, it was at Harvard. Right. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, and it also like the first time I've ever heard Danny Sheehan, you know, and I was like, um, and so ultimately, you know, sadly the project didn't, didn't work out, but I learned a lot about, hmm, about the experiencers, um, and who they, who they really are. And, you know, you have some like John Max are taking them seriously. Um, and then that led me to watch, um, the uh, documentary on the aerial school phenomenon. Mm-hmm. Right. Beautiful and, film. Yeah. And yeah. That's the South Africa school that, uh, mm-hmm. I don't know, 60 some odd kids or more. Had yeah. A, had an encounter with a basically flying saucer and two entities that yeah. landed, landed at their school, a sort of communal visitation that John Mack investigated. Um, and uh, the teacher, the principal yeah. ended up after denying it, at the time because she was under a lot of pressure ended up saying and ultimately she you know she believed the kids believed this happened it's completely you know um I, I and just so i'm clear in terms of before you know when you grew up uh you know when you're in college when you're going through your young adult life are you what is your stance regarding this type of thing this type of phenomenon yeah well i grew up in a very religious um household um you know very, you know, Southern Baptists. Um, and so we didn't ever talk about this stuff. Um, and so I was very agnostic to it, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I knew about Roswell and, you know, was skeptical, you know, about, about it all really, but, um, didn't really feel one way about it. Um, mostly cause I didn't pay attention to it really. Yeah. Um, and so, so yeah, it was the retreat and then, then just John Mack and then, you know, watching this aerial school phenomenon too and, you know, having kids and watching these kids and I'm like, they're not lying. These kids are not lying. And that just snowballed into me like researching, you know, and, um, and I had never been on Twitter before at all. Um, wow. And, uh, and the strike hits and, um, and I'm just like, okay, what is going on? Who are these people? Um, and, and I think it was that culmination of that. And I started watching all the docs, you know, one of the hundreds of docs that are out there. And, and then lo and behold, you know, the David Grush story breaks and I'm like, I don't think that guy's lying, you know? And when you have the inspiration, or the intelligence community inspector general call it, you know, urgent and credible. And with 40 firsthand witnesses and, and then, um, so then I joined Twitter and I'm like, okay, what's going on? Who, who are the, <laughs> so your first, the, your, your first bad decision. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I, uh, so yeah, I joined Twitter. So I wanted to find out who the people who were really kind of, out there, you know, and, and I remember watching the 60 minutes, um, you know, 2017, I guess it was with Lou Elizondo and, mm-hmm. and, and um, Gimbal yeah. video. And- yeah. I think that was 2000. Was it in 17? I think it might've might been the same year as the New York times article came out. Yeah. 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 It, it was like, I, I yeah. went back and watched it all and um, yeah. And then joined Twitter and then slowly just started figuring out who was who and started following people. And over the course of the, of the, um, of the uh, um, of the strike, 
you know, a lot of time on my hands. And so just kind of did a deep dive into the world and, you know, I'm fascinated, so fascinated by the, all the facets of it. Um, and so I was like, read about the soul symposium. I was like, how much, Hey, I want to go to that. You know, you're really, you seem a very serious, very educated people, you know, Gary Nolan and, you know, yeah. and a lot of, a lot of PhDs. In that yeah. Way. Yeah. And, um, and so, so yeah, so I was always waiting for the soul symposium um, to come around. I went to another retreat and um, did um, this time I was uh, psilocybin and five in the ODMT and pff, completely different experience. It's a great one, but whew, man, I was, I, you know, I went into it asking I want medicine. I want to, I want to know more about the world. What are these dimensions and what are all okay. these things? And so you're sort of now you're kind of like exploring a little bit because you've had yeah. a few experiences that were obviously fundamental and and kind of healing and you I guess I don't want to put words in your mouth like that your takeaway from those initial experiences was because I I was telling Dave or just before you came on like I had had a conversation with a you know a neuroscientist over the weekend of just talking about mapping the brain and but then talking about some of these some of these drugs, some of these chemicals and molecules and their interaction with the brain. And I was asking him like, so is there a script in the brain that is writing out these experiences or what? And as, um, as smart and informed and educated and, and he's down to like the neuronic, mo you know, the, like the most microscopic connections, like they are learning the brain down to the joists, but he doesn't, they don't know. They just don't know. And they're doing a lot of study on it. But I, so my question is to you, was that a script in your brain? Do you think, or, or, or is that, was that the departure point for you where you went? Yeah. Tap, no, tap, totally. Tapping into something outside the brain. Yeah, no, totally. Um, I, you know, and I think that was one of the things that I wished um, the soul symposium would have touched more on is sort of the, consciousness spirituality you know all of that element at play in all of it um and so yeah I, I look i think there's definitely a need to study the brain and science and the data all that's so incredibly important but there has to be some sort of bridge that includes you know consciousness um and so so yeah i, I think i think after my retreat there was a bit of departure in in terms of like you know, science, tell me what this is, you know, because I do think there's a, a, a kind of other, I, I don't even like to, I don't like, I, would hate to, I don't even want to call it interdimensional, but like there's, there's layers of things that, you know, we just haven't figured out quite how to tap into and mm -hmm. I think we will. Um, I don't know. It seems like people, are, some, some people are waking up a little bit too, to this stuff, I think. Um, and so, yeah. Well, it's, yeah. it's interesting because because so much of what the experience you described mirrors the described experience of people who've come back from being dead, mm -hmm. like yeah. who, have, who have had their whose hearts have stopped and their brains have have stopped having any electrical function. Yeah, and, I, and in fact, I just watched a, a documentary from N, uh, NYU um, um, Hospital did a research hospital put out a 40, 45 minute documentary called Rethinking Death. Mm -hmm. And they now they now refer to it as a recalled experience of death, not a near death experience. Yeah, because they're now reviving people who have been dead, uh, who have been really fundamentally dead for long periods of time, up to an hour, mm -hmm. and that they aren't they didn't have a near they're not having a near death experience. They're having an actual they're remembering being dead. Yeah, um, and it seems like that maybe you know maybe psychedelics is another way to tap into that same level of consciousness that that these people are experiencing at points when their brains are not by any me mechanism we understand that their brains are not functioning at all. Yeah. And yet still their consciousness remains intact. Their persona remains intact. Mm -hmm. um, and they're having, and they're encountering uh, beings and having experiences similar to what you described. Yeah. 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 And you know, in, in, there are so many different like levels, levels to, to it, you know, when, for instance, when all four of us were in the room together doing Ibogaine, 
you kind of cross over into the other person's experience. For example, um, uh, on the drive back from San Diego, um, I was telling, you know, one of the guys who was literally across the room and to the right of me. And, um, when we were, you know, in the medicine and, um, I was like, yeah, you know, I asked my guide and, you know, cause I, right, out, right after I got out of the military, I got a, I got a dog and, you know, I loved my dog so much and I had to put him down a few years ago. And so I was in the medicine and I asked my guide, I'm like, can I see my dog? I really want to see my dog. And lo and behold, he just comes, you know, comes out of nowhere and I'm kissing, loving on my dog. And I'm telling, you know, one of my, one of the guys and he's like, was it a yellow lab? And I go, yeah. He goes, dude, it ran right past my bed. No, get the fuck yeah. out of here. Oh, wow. I, I didn't tell him what kind of dog he wanted. <laughs> He's like, it ran right past my bed, straight to you. I tried to pet it, but, you know. Um, that's, so, yeah. That's great. That's great. Think, that's crazy, but that's yeah. great. But mm -hmm. I think that wow. happened. Um, you know, I don't think they're that, you know, and, you, you talk to some of the people who run these retreats and they're like, yeah, that that's that's not um, uncommon, you know. Um, so there's something to it. And I think, you know, we've been so conditioned to feel that these things are, you know, in party drugs or, you know, just recreational use. But when you take them, you know, like a, you know, in this ceremonial way and, you know, and not everybody has a great experience, you know, mm -hmm. he said, but, um, but it can be pretty life changing. Well, I know I, I myself, like I've had like been dealing with depression and, and PTSD from, from just normal life. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I did like, a um, ketamine therapy yeah because that's the because it's the one thing that's legal in in america yeah. um because it was made by a pharmaceutical company it doesn't doesn't grow on on manure yeah. um well you would hear something interesting i did my last retreat in austin um and it was through this organization that was started by this marine named justin Lapree, and he basically did his research and he found out that if you start a church you can use psychedelics as part of your ceremony. So he started a, a church um, um, called Who Wrote Path to Light. And, um, and you know, they do veterans retreats now full time using psilocybin and 5-MeO DMT. So even in like conservative Texas, you start a church, you can do psychedelics. Um, and I, I feel like I read somewhere that there was a, there, there was some there was a breakthrough and um, I could be completely making this up that in terms of allowing the, um, allowing these treatments to be used in the States. Am I, am I in wrong? Some places, or is there some the city progress of Denver getting has, made? I know the city of Denver and uh, I think the state of uh, Colorado has legalized it for, uh, uh, for medical use. Mm -hmm. um, and I think maybe. Or I think Oregon has Oregon. Yeah. He like dipped her toe, but not full on yet. But that's about it. Yeah, like, but then it's still, I don't think anyone's legalized DMT or, and that's yeah. usually just psilocybin, I think. Right? What was your, so you were about to say your last retreat, this was during the strike. It sounds mm -hmm. like you had a more interesting strike experience than, than, than me. <laughs> um, so what, what was that? What was that like? Because now this is your, you're kind of informed, you're, and you're there, you're going in with a kind of mission a little bit. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I, I kind of, you know, during the ceremonial part, I wrote out like what I wanted out of the medicine, you know, what I wanted to leave behind and, you know, still working on myself. So, you know, still improving on the things. And, but I also was like, I want you to show me, you know, the world we're not seeing, um, you know, what the world, the world's between the world. And, you know, you know, you know we're all supposedly just on vibrations and, you know, and, and frequency. And I want to understand that. And, and, um, but also, you know, I was like, I want to be with God again, you know, and, in all those things. And so I, I essentially just was like, take me on a very spiritual journey. And I could like, man, it, like I was, it took me uh, to places like, you know, like where I met like my guides, my angels. Right. And I, you know, it was like with, and then I met like my ancient higher self and, 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 you know, but it, it's, it's all metaphoric, I think maybe. Um, and, and then, 
you know, as the uh, hours went by and it's a much shorter, you know, it's like four to six hours. Is this the psilocybin or is this the DMT? Yeah. Okay. And, um, and, and, you know, I know this all sounds a little bit, you know, wonky, but, you know, I'm just like being shown d- all this wonderful, beautiful stuff. And, and then, you know, I'm like going through portals, moving through portals in between dimensions. And then I would be back in the room, you know, with all, you know, we had, I think there were like, there were about nine of us. And I would like be able to stop time, you know, like literally stop time and rewind it, you know, and, you know, we have like our, our therapists, you know, are moving around and I would be like, I'd be like, all right, can I, can I speak to you telepathically? And I would call them and they would look at me and they would be like, do you need anything? And I'd be like, uh-uh. you know? <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just fucking with you. Right? Yeah. Wow. And then I'd go back into another portal and then come back into the room and, with a new dimension on top of that dimension and, you know, and they're like starting to layer on top of each other. And, and, you know, anyway, it was, um, I know it sounds crazy, but it was, it was incredible. Like it was like having superpowers, you know? And, and, uh, so it's like, and, but at the same time, I'm seeing the visuals and everything and I'm not trying to make a whole lot of sense out of it other than it, there's a connection to it. Um, you know, I, I can't explain. I don't really have the, I guess the knowledge yet. Um, maybe one day to explain that, but what I asked to see, it showed me. Um, mm-hmm. so on some level, you know, I, so you, you asked if was my brain writing that script? I don't think my brain was writing that script because I don't think my brain really could just create that um, yeah i mean what's the infrastructure for that really you know it yeah. doesn't even um, you know where where does that exist that extra you know the portals and dimensions and entities and all of that um yeah where would that reside yeah. dave dave <laughs> where is that in my in my brain or in matt's weird, brain yeah that's the weird the, the interesting thing to me is like you've kind of come into the ufo uap subject uh from through a back door uh yeah. Because because I've said almost everyone I know who 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 gets deeply into the the UAP subject and thinks about it long enough, eventually comes around to thinking I really need to understand consciousness to understand this. Mm-hmm. And you sort of uh, were exploring consciousness first, yeah, and then found your way into this issue. Yeah, I mean, because I I'm not really super you know what interests me most about this topic is I'm not like super. I'm very interested in all of it, obviously, but I want to know more, um, first and foremost, like, are we alone in this universe? And I just, I just can't believe that, you know, it's, um, and, and I'm also very interested, if not concerned about what if, you know, what if say the Schumer amendment had really gone in through the NDAA intact and what if we had disclosure in the next few years? Um, you know, I'm like, what interests me more is how society will change, how our world will change, um, how we as a species would change, um, what that would mean for everything. And, um, I'm curious to hear what you guys would think, like, let's, let's say hypothetically tomorrow, a world leader, we'll say an American president came out and told American people over time, we'll tell you what we know, but we are not alone in the universe. Do you think, do you think people would just go, all right, you know, on as usual? I think they would. I mean, I, it's, I, 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 it's, I could be wrong, but I, I think barring something, you know, people wake up when something's knocking at their door. Um, you know, uh, you know, I think, and, and, and I don't mean this entirely as a bad thing. I think, people could probably handle it. I think society could absorb it. I think a lot of people would be like, finally, you know, like, yeah, of course, you know, obviously. I mean, the experiencer movement and the amount of, the number of people that uh, just, once you, if you talk to them, and you, I'm sure you've experienced this, just, just after a few minutes, if you talk about it, they're like, oh yeah, I did have, like so many people have had some kind of experience or 
know someone who had a really significant experience. Like it's almost ubiquitous in a way. Like, yes, some people are like, I've been studying this all my life and never seen a UFO like George Knapp, for example. But I mean, a huge majority of people have. So I kind of think that, yes, on the one hand, we, we tend to go like whatever's the shiny bright object. And that's the bad part of the fact that I think people would be. But, but I also think, I think there is a readiness. I, th I think the, the world can handle it. I, I think religions would it, incorporate it, um, you know, because in some ways they already have, you know, I mean, in some ways there's already the built-in mythology that, that accounts for, you know, space beings or angels or demons or, you know, this and sort of otherworldly, I don't know, Dave, what do you think? Um, I think in like, in, in some ways, it's, um, for example, I think the Catholic church has been preparing for this for a long time. Mm. <clears throat> I think they, you know, they had, information and knowledge that we that maybe the rest of us didn't have but they've they've been preparing for it and um you know even put out encyclicals on how on what it would mean if there was an another species came to earth um you know saying that it would essentially just uh, you know expand uh the ministry of christ um so i think a lot, I think a lot of religious people will, will be able to just incorporate it into their belief structures um i think i think some people will be I think, uh, I think some people might be devastated by it. Um, I think um, the groups might have the most difficulty dealing with the scientific community. I think might have the most difficulty, yeah, because they're going to be displaced from sort of uh, their, you know, their their altar, really. Yeah, uh, as you know, and you know, when you when you you know when you spend a lot of time like becoming the smartest people on earth, and then you find out, oh. That, great you're the, you're the smartest cat um you know or you're the, you're the smartest squirrel in the park mm -hmm. uh, it's not really that impressive uh so i think it'll be difficult for them and i think it's also going to be probably be difficult for a lot of the ufo community who, who who may find it really difficult who believe that this is a benign force that's coming to save us yeah uh, if that turns out not to be true i think that that could be they may be the people who have real trouble adapting Mm -hmm. um, and I think, uh, and I think it's also no matter what, I think in, until whatever the non-human intelligence is starts really interacting with us on a, on a frank and sort of a direct way, there's going to be a lot of people who just act like nothing's happening anyway. Yeah. Same way, right now. I mean, there's, there's, there's ample reason for everyone to be freaked out right now. You know, there's ample information available for everyone to be in a panic right now, if they were going to panic. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I don't know the ability of people to just ignore um, facts in front of them. Um, I mean, you know, and to choose to believe facts that are clearly uh, ungrounded. Um, <laughs> you know, I think we're seeing uh, far too many examples of that every single day now. Yeah. Uh, and it's, you know, it's part of what's tearing our, you know, our culture apart right now. Yeah. So I, I think it's, it's going to be much like it is right now. It's going to be uh, a very, it's a very, be a varied response uh, depending on, on, on what mindset people are bringing to it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's assuming that, that, that we basically get, we're allowed to continue to live fundamentally as we have been yeah that whatever is behind this allows us to keep you know go on and having our governments and our industries and our our religions and our sports teams and you know all of that just goes on as it as it has um you know so the far more frightening as thought is well what if that isn't how this works yeah what if we're coming to um what if we're coming to a, a place in the non-human schedule that we aren't, we didn't, we weren't a part of setting up, mm -hmm. and that we have no say in. And what if they, what if they've, you know, whatever they've been interested in, they've, they've come to the end of that experiment. And what if they're moving on to a next stage? That, that, that could change what change the whole thing for all of us. That's disturbing, Dave. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. Matt and I are going to stay over here on the optimistic side of things. Although I don't, I don't speak for you, Matt. I don't know where you, you know, where you land on that. You know, I, you know, I, I try to be, you know, as a storyteller, I try to think about it 
in a way outside of the box because it's such a it's such an out of the box topic and i just don't think any i don't think it'll go any way anybody can really predict um i um i think it'll fundamentally change a lot of people so like i you know like like for me for instance i i mean I, my worldview is completely changed now because you know i i've never seen the ufo I've, I've never been i've never had an abduction experience i've had some you know weird stuff from time you know but i just but like once you you once you go to like the soul symposium and you listen to you know nobel you know finalists talk to you about you know like isotope ratios of material that was basically shit out of a, a craft you know and, mm -hmm. you know and and you have like an admiral talk to you about you know what you know the navy's not telling us you know and you I mean, yeah <laughs> that air aircraft carriers are being shut down by yeah. So oh. something under the water. Yeah, that Tim Galladay. Tim Galladay was an interesting. That was. Yeah. I have to say yeah. his. Yeah, when you was, hear this, there are things underwater that are breaking this the uh, speed of sound. Yeah, I mean, I know, and so, and then you you know, and and, and this is just on top, like we said earlier, the vast amount that's, are it's there to look at to yeah. you know, and in unclassified. CIA files and government files. There's like so much. Um, yeah. And, you know, and I had the argument with my wife because she first, she, she got more on the topic way before I did. And when she would try to engage me about it, I would just be like, oh, come on, honey. Like, this isn't a secret they you, anyone can keep. No one can keep the secret. And then, you know, when I really started learning about it, I'm like, oh, this is how they keep it a secret, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Um, by putting it out there, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. They do seem to be, because we had Jeremy Corbell on a couple of weeks ago and and um, who's in contact a lot with David Grush and they've sort of been, you know, and it does, I mean, it sounds like the the, the pressure campaign, um, the, 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 the real, real um, threat with the classified information seems real, you know, that, that it seems that that is a very purposeful, uh, they want to kind of keep them quiet as much as possible. That it's a very stressful thing, um, for, for David Grush and for anyone that tries to kind of come forward, they really have to walk this ridiculous line that, um, you know, I, I think is, if someone's threatening me or my freedom or my safety or any, you know, yeah. I, I'm uh, so I, I mean, I, I, I can believe people are silenced. I can believe people have to sign. If you want to, you know, if you want to play in this playground, you got to sign your life away. If you got to, you want to play in this sandbox, you're going to vow and swear under penalty of whatever you'll, you never get to talk about it. I could believe those, those exist, those, you know, yeah. agreements exist. And I think that would, you know, that would do a lot to, to block off about 90% of it. I mean, uh, to the, but to your point, there's still this incredible volume of anecdotal evidence of witness testimony of pilot testimony. Um, I don't want to forget. I was, um, struck by your description of your encounter with that darkness mm -hmm. in your first, ex and I know you, just now we're kind of attributing it to like something very much a part of you very much like the, you know, uh, God knows what kind of sort of emotional tar had just kind of built up or rage or anger and your experiences. It, however, in this, I'm reading, you know, you mentioned Diane Pasolka, like I'm reading encounters. I don't know yeah. if you've read it. There's a, yeah. but there's yeah. an account, there's an account of a kind of experience of someone that was, um, a scientist still using a pseudonym that she was talking to this Tyler D. Tyler. Yeah, yeah. And Tyler, yeah. yeah, and and this kind of battle he had with this darkness in this vision that was um I don't know, there's some striking similarities. I don't know if that I don't know if you read that or made the same or if I'm perhaps uh, making comparisons where where it's not appropriate, but I just thought bringing it up because I just it, when I when I was reading it, I was remembering your you know when we had talked about this 
you know, a couple months back where I was like, wow, that was sort of, um, I don't know. Did, did, did you recall that story? Because it, it led to a whole talk about St. Michael, you know, this, um, and he thought he saw an angel and this was, he didn't, wasn't sure if it was an, it wasn't really an abduction, but it was clearly an experience to him. It was something that was extraordinarily vivid, as real as this. And, um, but did involve and, you know, having to kill something, a sort of shadow form, I guess, in this case, yours, you described it almost as difficult to describe visually, but, um, do you recall that from her book or is that, I mean, yeah. it seems really I don't know, eerily similar. Yeah, no, um, I, I never thought of it, um, in, in terms of it being like a similar experience, but I think there is probably an element of it, um, in terms of, you know, where and who we are spiritually, um, and what that part of us is communicating with. Um, uh, you know, whether you believe in God or evil or, you know, I, I, you know, my, my first experience, like my experience through all of it, um, sort of solidified an idea that I had that there's no hell. Um, I Hmm. just, I, you know, and, and I, I, I just, I felt so, and, and, involved in tune like surrounded by and inside of of like the universe and god and um and i was like and, and just like i said crippling love like it, it's like and words can't really describe it um at all because there are no words for it. it's like a it's a different language um and and i was like there's no way like a creator that can give us this when we go to this to eternal damn fire, you know, like it just uh, like it logically doesn't line up for me, but I, um, but there, maybe there is a big, maybe there is a part of us that is, has that darkness and maybe that's coming from, from somewhere, you know, it's, it's manifest somehow, um, manifest through our experiences, um, our beliefs, I think who we surround ourselves with and what, like after my first retreat, I stopped watching the news. I no longer watch it. I read, you know, a couple of newspapers in the morning to figure out just to stay informed. But like our TV does not come on the news anymore. Um, mm-hmm. And man, yeah, I, I find yeah, because I, I was in, I've been a news junkie my whole life, and but I and I find now it's like I'm kind of forcing myself to watch the news. Yeah. Um, whereas before it was to, just that's what I did all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, especially like last election and, you know, the four years prior and you know, just yeah. beating my head to death with every day something else is coming out and, you know, scandals and, and, you know, and I, you know, I was one of those families too. I mean, this is, this is a true story. Um, I, my wife and I, you know, we're always sort of like the, you know, and my sister too, but my sister so she'd be so left. She's right sometimes, you know? Um, and, uh, but you know, my wife and I have always been, you know, lean left We're Democrats. And, um, you know, during the Trump presidency, we were both of my family, especially too. Like there, we, we had a lot of problems, a lot of yeah. issues and they were caused, yeah. caused by our political divides yeah. and how they could justify believing in something. And, how I could justify it. And it just, there was no, there was no space for compromise. And when I got back home from my first retreat, first thing, one of the first things I did was I emailed all my family and I said, I'm sorry for being an asshole for the last five years. Um, you know, and since then, like, you know, I, I just listen, I don't try to, I just try to engage them in it and, you know, not get too political, but engage them when they want to talk about it. But I don't try to force feed them, you know, any disagreements or ideology, you know, I just try to, you know, listen empathetically and, um, you know, and, and again, my whole worldview has changed, you know, I just sort of, you, you see things just a little bit differently. The world actually looks different, you know, um, than it did. It seems like unfiltered in ways. Um, so, so yeah, and now, you know, we're in the middle of this year and 
going to be. Did, I was going to just say, I'm sorry, and I'm sorry. Trump did it change? Did yeah. it change how you felt about mortality? This, these, these sort of journeys. I mean, yeah, I, I like no fear of death at all anymore. Like I truly feel like I died, and um, and I just feel like I don't know. I think we're. I feel like you know what was what's the quote? Um, we're all spiritual beings just having a human experience. I forgot who who said that, but we're all spiritual be- beings just having a human experience. And I think it was Chuck Schultz. Yeah. Um, peanuts. <laughs> was it really? No, no, I'm making that. Up. <laughs> Wait, Snoopy. Snoopy. Snoopy said, yeah, could have been. Yeah. You know, Charlie but, Brown's got yeah. some nuggets of wisdom in there. But, well, but I can say, like, I, 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 I have had a similar experience um, just from doing the ketamine therapy. Which is a much less dramatic and much more a much less um, intense drug experience than than uh, ayahuasca or ibogaine or or even psilocybin, um, but I definitely had that same thing where, where um, uh, like all of my the, I, where I found all the rage that I thought I had suppressed through intellectual effort and that I had eliminated, you know, all the all the anger and rage and fight and fight or flight impulses. Mm-hmm. that I thought I had already taken care of. I realized after the, uh, the ketamine therapy, went, oh, no, there it is. And, oh, look, there's a, there's all the crazy behavior that I displayed uh, as a result of it. You yeah. know, that's, there's all the displaced anger and there's the displaced fear, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and rage. Um, and so, I mean, you know, and as I said, much less dramatic and I think much less impactful type of therapy than what you've been going through. But I, yeah, later I'd like to, I, I, sometime I I really wanted to try those kind of retreats. Yeah, I mean, you, I I, I would recommend it. I, w- I would recommend it to anybody, like even like my wife, you know, who just needed to go to understand. Yeah, yeah where where you what you were going through. Yeah, you know, it, but it's you know it, it offers and you know it, like, and again I think it's important to do it in a, in in some form of ceremonial way where you're yeah you're tapping into not not just psychic the psychedelic but you're tapping into the potential of, of what it you know yeah. be, what it can mean um so um yeah and i was gonna say also i've, I've also found like from that and through through, through then beginning curious about consciousness yeah I, like i'm a, like a lifelong atheist I always believes that you know that death was the end of it the the universe essentially evaporates from my from being uh relevant to me the minute i'm dead yeah. And now, now I'm going. Uh, you know, and I took quite quite a lot of comfort in that idea, and now I'm I'm not at all sure about it. Now I do, you know, from experiences like what you've described and what I've what I've read about near death or or what they're now calling um, a recalled experiences of death. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and also just other uh, example like you know remote viewing the stuff that Hal put off and Russell Targ did at Stanford for years, uh, and other psychic phenomenon. You start going well. Uh, now I'm going. Well, hey, there there might be something about us that does exist outside of us and after us or before us, and and that this is you know we're just living in a very narrow uh, slice of of reality right now. Yeah, and that's uh and that's um and that's something I think as 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 an atheist I'm still going. Oh no, I don't want wait a minute. This. I don't well, want that. I don't want to. I don't want these comforting thoughts in my head. No, it, it's a hard thing to face. It, it's you know, like Christianity. I mean, I, I would still consider consider myself a Christian, I guess, because um, you know, if if we're gonna believe, you know, and I'm not trying to justify it because I genuinely believe, but um, if I could take the step forward. And to say, okay, I believe that we're not alone in the universe, that non-human intelligence that have been visiting us and these crafts have been visiting us. Um, is that as crazy as saying that, you know, Jesus was the son of God or, you know, the prophet Muhammad, you know, was, you know, the, the son of God, you know, or the prophet, God's the prophet. So, I mean, I'm, I don't not believe any of those really, I mean, I, I think they all serve something that we need, I guess. Um, and I don't, I, I hate when they're, when they're used to corrupt us and, you know, divide us and, but are yeah. they a realm of possibility? I mean, well, yeah. it's the thing you sort of go with, 
you know, if what we're hearing, you know, if, if people can be levitated from their beds, floated through solid walls yeah. and, and taken up on craft, you know, and if I can, if I can sort of get my head to accept that might be a reality, then certainly I can, I can think, well, throughout history, if human beings have encountered this kind of, you know, what Arthur C. Clarke said, any advanced technology is indistinguishable from, you know, magic, mm -hmm. um, any, you know, uh, uh, what is it? I forget the actual term he used, but uh, but uh, so now I'm going. Well, all right. I guess I've always just dismissed accounts of miracles as just being superstition in the past, and you know, and stories told to convince people to, to follow these rules. Mm -hmm. And I'm going. No, well, maybe these miracles happened, and maybe we've that's humans have told human stories to explain what they've encountered. Yeah. But maybe we've just always been in touch with this non-human intelligence, and we've. You know, the Greeks created their uh, narrative to to focus it, and uh, you know the Romans theirs, mostly stolen from the Greeks. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, and then the you know Christians and and the Muslims, you know, all you know put, you know, had their encounters and and again we just keep get putting it in a human context. Yeah, yeah. You know? And even now, I'm, I'm I mean, we how can we do anything but? Yeah. It's funny. My takeaway, it's, I want to almost amend my answer of this, the Saul takeaway, because I do, you know, Matt, you're bringing this up. I, it's almost, I feel like we're on this kind of huge cosmic arc back to our own mythology, um, mm -hmm. where the more I was listening, the more it felt like science was kind of taking us kind of back to our, back to our original stories in some ways. Um, and I found, I, you know, and, and maybe reading this book just about, you know, this, this early idea of some civilizations and cultures to just the idea of a sentience to everything, you know, and, and that maybe we're just a little divorced from the language we used to have or this, this ability to hear and communicate um, with that part of our world and that this is kind of about, this is about moving us back to this place where uh, we have a little bit more um, conscious, well, consciousness, but we're not really connected to it in a way, you know, whereas we, maybe it's a, it's kind of a, a reuniting with a, with a consciousness that, that maybe our earlier selves had, or your ancient self that you met, you know, or in, had an encounter with had that, um, that we've kind of lost. Uh, I thought there was some aspects discussed about that it's all that felt relevant to me and it's certainly the stuff that you know diane pasolka is talking mm -hmm. about um kind of hearing that and um i'm a little bit of a wuss i don't think i can do these retreats necessarily i'm not sure my constitution can handle it but um maybe it can i don't know i will we'll, we'll yeah. see where but uh yeah it's 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 fascinating and i don't know if it has to discount anything you know uh, as 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 long as you as you said, it's not you being used to divide us. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I thought that was uh, that. I think that that feels like maybe where we're headed. Yeah. I don't know what you think. Well, you know, when we take religion in in itself, is is sort of boxes you into a you know a, a belief system that doesn't allow you to, you know go out and be curious about this or about that or about that. Because if you come back and you're like, wait a minute, you know, suddenly, you know, you're, you, you start questioning, uh, have I been believing in something all my life? That's a lie or, you know, and, and so people say they, they stay in their lane and, you know, and I get that. I understand that. Um, because, you know, as a species, what do we do? We, you know, we, you know, we're born, you know, we procreate, we work, we pay bills, we die, you know, and I'm like, that's not living. That's not, that's not a human purpose. Like we're not, we're, we're meant for more, you know, we're meant to connect more to something, you know, for, for a larger purpose, some form of, again, consciousness, awareness of something that plugs us in. You know, I, 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 I've gotten to a place where I just can't believe that, that is our purpose, you know, just procreate, consume, you know, die, 
you know, we live every day the same just to pay the bills and, you know, and I, I just don't feel like that is what the purpose of our lives are. Um, yeah. Well, somehow we are in this pattern of it and I don't know how do we break free of this pattern. Um, and so, you know, and that's what interests me a lot too about, you know, potential disclosure, because I think that would, you know, they, they threw on the term a lot of what ontological shock, but you know, and I loved uh, Chris Mellon's speech because, you know, he was like, maybe that's what we need. Maybe that's just what we need right now and just shock us out of, you know, these stupid wars and, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah. I think it, that might be the saddest outcome of all is if we get disclosure and nothing changes. Yeah. That, I mean, that if human beings are just so stubborn. Yeah. That, you know, that in the face of disclosure, we still just, you know, we, we don't do anything differently. That, that might be the saddest outcome. Yeah, we're turning into, you know, a global arms race, you know, or something like that. Yeah, know. to just try and decipher the technology and not, you know, yeah. take on take on the more sort of the, the more important aspect of it. Yeah. Have you guys um, listened to or, or read Christopher Bledsoe's book? You know who Christopher Bledsoe is? I, I haven't read the book. I've, 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 I've listened to a lot of interviews with him. Which is really what's that book? Because I'm on a I'm on a tear. What's UFO of God? Yeah, Christopher UFO, the UFO of God. Oh, okay. And um, um, yeah, I mean, and I I tend to believe everything he says because he's out there like doing shows like Joe Rogan and not Joe Rogan, um, Concrete and some of these other big podcasts. And he was even on the um, Beyond Skinwalker Ranch. Yeah. Series. Yeah. And they were, they were with him and he, he said, well, here, they're come, here they come. And then they're, Oh, is that that guy? Oh, was he, show up. Yeah. They, he kind of calls them, right? He can, yeah. he, he can sit and bring them and, 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 but they're like orbs of light and he, to him, it's all, all spiritual, very, very spiritual. And, but you know, he's got people from NASA and all these government agencies that are studying his brain, plugging in and st- trying to study his brain. Um, yeah. And they're not, they're not, yeah, he, could, he could say, look at that part of the sky. <laughs> He'll tell you where I recall that. Uh, yeah. I recall. And I didn't realize like, oh. that was who that was. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That was fascinating. Yeah. And I'm, uh, you know, and I'm glad that he's out there talking about it, you know, and um, I mean, he's on Instagram. He, he literally posts, posts it. <laughs> weekly here they are here they come you know and yeah. you, you have yeah, i gotta follow him yeah you have I mean, you have like i said people at nasa and at nsa and you know the national geospatial you know office and national reconnaissance office coming to see him and hand him these elements to see how he'll react to it and you know it's just like why why is it that guy like, why is not New York Times doing a huge piece on that guy? You know? yeah. I, because Jean Kirkpatrick told him it's all fake. So. Uh, yeah. Well, I also think conflict is commerce, right? Like, that's, you, that's why you stop watching the news. That's why the news yeah. exists now. It exists as an as a entertainment medium to, to rile us up and piss us off mm-hmm. and keep us, you know, it was, um, it was what was really just wrecking my mom in her last years. It was such a vibrant, happy person who was just like, and even though she was watching the MSNBC and not the Fox version, it was still, it was the same conflict. It was the conflict entertainment. And I think that that, hopefully that would be what gets ontologically fucking kicked to the curb is this, this need or this, this, um, the, the, what is what's the word i just I, the it's it just we have to remove the profit from that somehow you know it just yeah. somehow has mm-hmm. to maybe maybe something can come along that just kicks our ass so hard that we take yeah. a new look at the world because when things do happen now sadly it's when usually it's when sad things happen there's this moment of like you know, you know everybody's like sort of focused in the same way and you haven't yet chosen a side or you haven't had fo- you haven't yet or the media hasn't yet chosen a, a way to make you hate the other side again you know it's like for a moment things can happen where we're like oh shit like we're all just kind of in the same world experiencing the same thing before somebody figures out a way to manipulate it 
Well, um, ha- hatred and rage are much more unifying than basically than, than love and, and empathy. Uh, yeah. You know, they, they, it's always been the most unifying factor in humanity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which yeah. is sad. You know, <laughs> it, and I, yeah. I, I've come to the realization too that, you know, you, it's going to take guys like Gary Nolan and, and, you know, these really smart people, scientists, um, and it's going to take, you know, it's going to take a head of state, someone to come out and they're going to have to show the American public something, you know, mm-hmm. craft or something. I mean, they can't just say, you know, but, you know, and I, you know, like Carl Nell's disclosure, you know, yeah, I, 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 we should recommend people who have that the Soul Foundation has now published all of their ta- all of the talks, uh, all the lectures on on their own um, like Instagram and, and and on X and I guess they have a website and YouTube. They have a YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. So all of these, like the people that we're talking about, all of the, th- the talks that we got to see at Soul are all now available to anybody who wants to wants to hear them. And it's remarkable. Yeah, that stuff. Carl Nell one was a. It's a yeah, humdinger. I, yeah, I just rewatched the Kevin Knuth one too. Oh, that was a great oh, one. Yeah. No, he was he was one of my favorites too. Yeah, yeah. I think he's coming up on an episode of Really. He I think is we get to be talk with, with him yeah, soon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, that'll be cool. Listening um, to him talk about physics is like watching a, a kid playing with a, their favorite toy. You know? Yeah. Like, oh yeah, yeah, totally, totally. He was great. Yeah. Um, and actually, and you. Uh, are great and this this was an amazing talk man i i just yeah really thank you so much for doing this so just yeah. grateful yeah, for, for your oh my god we, we've kept you on so long i'm sorry but <laughs> it was yeah. it was <laughs> awesome <laughs> i'm gonna go now <laughs> it was awesome no it just your you know thank like just the story was just both uh, so interesting so honest and i think um it's i'm just so also happy for you that you've been kind of you know, a spiritual warrior through this entire thing and, and, um, have found yeah. hopefully some, some peace through it. Yeah. Uh, you, what I mean, you've yeah, been you've through. Ex- you've experienced like the darkest part of humanity and, you know, going off to war. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I, I've, you know, one thing I, I think I've come to one thing that I've, some, what I've been led to is a realization is, you know, I don't think we can elevate someone's, you know, trauma above anybody else's. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, we have all got to find our ways to, to unfuck and heal ourselves. And, um, you know, I think, mean, you know, collectively to make the world a better place. So, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, I appreciate you guys having me on. This was a lot of fun. Thanks. Oh, it was awesome. And, and well, if, we, you, if you, if you don't know him yet, you should meet Ernie Klein. He's a, your neighbor in Austin. Oh yeah, totally. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And he's very into this, all these, this subject. Yeah. I know oh, we need to do like a, a writer symposium in Texas because like we just talked with Ernie and and we should do like another pod where we just can just bitch about the business, which of course yeah. we need to, you know, <laughs> that's always fun. Are you going to do South by Southwest this year? Uh, we, 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 are, we have no plans to do it. We're going to go to uh, Contact in the Desert this summer. Okay. Oh, that'll be fun. That'll be but uh, yeah, South by Southwest would be, would be, I've been there a few times. I love yeah. it. Yeah. I, I haven't been. I'm ready. In the space, you know, um, but uh Anyway, we well, appreciate it, guys. Please stay in touch. Uh, look forward to seeing you guys again. All right. This Thanks was a lot. awesome, Matt. Great to see you again. Thanks so much. Yeah, take care.